Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Howard Coe. It's my great, great pleasure to see you all and to welcome you in person and online for a very exciting event entitled Older Adults Pathways into and out of housing and security and homelessness. We're very proud to present this event because it's the first in a series regarding housing and homelessness. And we're also equally proud that four Harvard organizations have joined together to put this event on for you in person and online. The organizations are the Harvard Chan School Initiative on Health and Homelessness, the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies, the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative, or ALI, and the Harvard Kennedy School Government Performance Lab. And we have leaders from all those organizations here today, and I just want to thank you all for making this event possible. So we are going to hear today about a very exciting new study that's been conducted at the Harvard Joint Center on Housing Studies about the topic of older adults in housing and security and homelessness. And we have a packed agenda. So let me tell you what it's going to look like over the next 50 minutes. Uh, first, Dr. Samara Sheckler, who is a research associate at the Harvard Joint Center, will be presenting the highlights from this key study. She'll be doing that over 15 to 20 minutes. And then we'll have two experts who have joined us here who will provide reactions and commentary. Uh, Dr. Sheckler is all the way at the end on, on my right. And then next to her is Emily Cooper, uh, MPH, and a person with tremendous experience in state government here in Massachusetts. She's special advisor on housing at Mass Health, the state Medicaid organization and also Chief Housing Officer for the Massachusetts Executive Office of Elder Affairs. The second expert commentator will be Dr. Latanya Wright. She's the Director of Outreach for Hearth Incorporated, and that's a very important special organization dedicated to these issues. You'll be hearing more from Dr. Wright. And then we'll move into Q&A, both from the in-person audience and online. If you want to submit questions online, our, our wonderful colleague, David Luberoff, Deputy Director of the Harvard Joint Center on Housing Studies, will be monitoring and offering some. And then the final commentary will be from our great colleague, Dr. Jen Walensky at the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies. Uh, she is the Project Director there on Housing and Aging Society and is also a member of our steering committee for the Initiative on Health and Homelessness here at the Harvard Chan School. So a very busy 50 minutes, and I think you're going to learn a lot. So Dr. Sheckler, why don't you start, and welcome, and thank you so much for your very important work. Thank you so much, Dr. Ko. And um, I'm so excited to <clears throat> lay the groundwork today uh, by presenting uh, this work that's um, kind of hot off the presses uh, at the Joint Center. Uh, I've been produced uh, myself, Jen Malinsky, Chris Herbert, John Arenas, Saad Soria, and Kathleen Gotingo. Um, well, uh, we're, we're still putting final, final touches on it, but um, this is a great time to have this conversation. Um, this, this project was funded by the Social Security Administration, but the opinions and conclusions are entirely our own. Um, as I said, the work is in progress. It'll be published later this fall, and I hope you'll uh, come back to the center's website for a link so that you can read the, the full paper. We designed this research to explore later life housing insecurity and homelessness. We particularly wanted to focus on the relationship between public program and benefit use and older adult housing security so that we could highlight age-related differences in access to programs and services that could support housing security of, of older adults in particular. I'll open with some broad definitions and concepts that we will probably use uh, throughout the panel today. Um, so the definition of homelessness itself can vary. Um, it's helpful to consider HUD's framework of literal homelessness in which uh, people don't have a fixed, regular, or adequate nighttime residence. Um, so this inadequacy might mean that the space is unsafe or substandard, like an abandoned building, or that it's public or otherwise just not designed for someone to live in, like maybe a bus station. Um, an episode of homelessness is considered to end once someone has been securely housed for a week, and people who are chronically homeless are defined by HUD to have had a series of episodes that add up to 12 months of being unhoused. Um, we also want to talk about people who have a place to live, um, but they're struggling to maintain that, that living situation. Um, so, so we'll call these people housing insecure. Um, housing insecurity can happen for a range of reasons. It can arise from an economic problem or uh, perhaps the housing situation is a poor fit for the resident. 
Um, age will be a key part of our conversation today, so we should define uh, what we mean when we talk about older adults, at least in this project. Um, people who live with the stress of homelessness experience age-related conditions and mortality um, about two decades earlier than people who are stably housed. So like other research on the intersection of aging and homelessness, um, our team defined older adults as anyone 50 or older because they have the biological aging experience of, of someone who's much more advanced in years. Um, and then finally, we wanna separately consider people who have chronically experienced homelessness uh, and people who lose their housing uh, for the first time later in life. Um, researchers in the Hope Home study found that later onset homelessness is often preceded by some amount of housing insecurity, that tips into homelessness when the resident experiences some kind of major disruption. Um, those researchers call this disruption a triggering event, and it might describe a situation like a new illness or the loss of a spouse or, or caregiver. So we think this world work is timely um, because adults 65 and older are the fastest growing demographic of people who experience homelessness. Um, despite high rates of mortality in 2020, fully a third of those considered chronically homeless uh, were at least 55 years old. Rising rates of older adult homelessness are related at least in part to the aging of people who have been chronically housing insecure or unhoused uh, throughout their lives. Our work that we'll talk about today will rely on two sources um, to study uh, this, this topic of older adult homelessness and benefits and services needs and, and utilization. Um, to get a, a sense of these trends, um, we first obtained access to homelessness management information system data for Massachusetts. Um, so this is a place where client level data is collected, managed and reported by service providers uh, who, who are supporting people experiencing homelessness. Um, this HMIS data, uh, it's usually maintained at the local level um, at, at the uh, continuum of care level, which is like a regional decision making body in this policy space. But Massachusetts has recently created the Rehousing Data Collective, which compiles all of the HMIS data for the entire Commonwealth into one database. Um, and this collective has been very helpful to us in facilitating our, our access and use of the data and really speaks to the power of, of uh, having data and, and organizing it in a way that it can be used. Um, overall, Massachusetts has been an excellent case study for us to examine housing pressures faced by older adults and the moderating role of services. Um, the Commonwealth ranked third among all states for housing unaffordability in 2022 and has the 12th highest rate of homelessness. But it also has the highest rates of sheltered homelessness uh, or people who aren't sleeping on the streets, suggesting that there's a robust service system um, as compared to other states. Uh, among all major US cities, Boston, um, with a housing first approach that was adopted in 2015 has the lowest rates of people sleeping outside at night um, of, of all major cities. Uh, it also has services uh, such as Hearth, represented on our panel by Dr. Wright, um, that focus specifically on supporting the, the unique needs of older adults and, and their, their, their unique and specific housing needs. So using HMIS data, we first confirmed that indeed, older adults are experiencing housing instability and homelessness, and an increasing share of Massachusetts residents with these experiences are older. Um, in 2021, older adults represented three out of every 10 unhoused people. And the data also confirmed uh, that resources change with age. Older adult, and again, this is all representing people who are, are unhoused, uh, older adults in, the, in Massachusetts uh, who are unhoused were less likely to report earned income uh, than, than their under 50 counterparts, and they were generally more reliant on public benefits programs. So interviews with practitioners gave us a better sense of the experiences undergirding these trends. Uh, later, later life housing and secur uh, security was especially challenged in three major ways. So first, older adults are more vulnerable to rising rents. Um, as uh, one interviewee explained to us, people have lived in their homes for decades, all of a sudden, the landlord realizes that the apartment is worth much more and there's a drastic rent increase. 
However, uh, with rental assistance in short supply, we know that only one in four eligible households actually receive a housing subsidy that they need and are eligible to, to get. Um, older adults are also more likely to need accessible housing. Um, so their current residents may become inadequate uh, if they have a functional limitation and their housing options may be further restricted uh, to places that are both affordable and physically accessible for them, um, which drops, right, the number of housing available because of our, our lack of, of accessible housing uh, in, in this area and throughout the U.S. Finally, older adults are more likely to need daily assistance, but without a residence, it's hard to access those services. Um, many might rely on families and neighborhood uh, and, and, and neighbors, you know, supports and friends for this help. But uh, we also know that isolation increases with age. Um, one interview that we, we spoke to explained it this way. They said, our residents who are formerly homeless have often severed family ties. It's more the norm than the aberration. Uh, if they have family, the family is located somewhere else. Sometimes our best success as a service provider uh, are in reuniting families as a long-term housing solution. So the literature suggests that there are numerous individual factors related to the risk of homelessness. These range from social isolation to poverty and housing cost burden. You can see them listed here in that gray column. Um, through this research, through our work, we expand this framework to include factors related to aging, which we believe compound these individual risk factors. These age-related factors in, in the blue column range from cognitive and physical disability to a diminished support network, limited earnings, and the cumulative impacts of multiple disparities, um, especially as experienced over time. So to fit these pieces together, we'll take a look across the second row. Homelessness rates are higher among people who have physical disabilities and chronic health conditions. Uh, that's something that we know. Risk of both of these conditions increases with age. Um, so, so we see that, that there's more risk uh, for someone as they age. These challenges could be moderated by access to healthcare, long-term care supports, supplemental income programs, housing accessibility, and community services and transportation networks. Um, so there's a number of policy areas that might be moderators of, of this risk. So central takeaway um, that we want you to go home with is that age intersects with other factors that increase the risk of housing insecurity. And older adults may rely more heavily on social policy and public programs uh, in order to remain stably housed. We expect benefit programs to be very important to older adults experiencing homelessness because disability rates are very high among unhoused people uh, and increase with age. But we know that access to these systems, these benefit systems is uneven. Older adults have very low approval rates for SSI and SSDI programs and the wait time for these uh, services can be very long. So our next takeaway is that systemic problems and gaps reduce the effectiveness of public programs for older beneficiaries. Um, so first, long wait times, as we just discussed, for affordable housing, for benefits, for services, these all increase housing vulnerability. Um, for example, one interviewee described a woman who uh, had severely compromised mobility, she lost her job, uh, and began to receive SSDI, but only after submitting an application, waiting the waiting period, and then having to submit an appeal in the interim, she lost her housing because she had no income. Um, so while the application was under review, she became unhoused. Um, next, needed supports are not always available to older adults. So our interviewees emphasized that uh, it was it's almost always more efficient to help a person remain housed than to have to help them find a new place to live, um, both economically and in terms of the organization's time. However, um, the resources to make a current residence fit are not always available. So for instance, interviewees describe difficulties funding home modifications, um, especially for renters, uh, and, and that older renters uh, were struggling in unsafe or inaccessible conditions while they were waiting for approval or installation of items like a ramp or a grab bar and risking a fall, uh, which, which could make their, their housing situation uh, truly not workable anymore. 
Uh, finally, program rules and exclusions limit housing options. Um, this is especially uh, difficult for people who have criminal records or whose immigration status is out of step with federal housing rules. Um, affordable housing rules can have other impacts as well. They can make it hard for older adults to get help from their family. So many subsidized residents limit longer stay visitors in the, in, in the house, in the subsidized house, which prevents an older person from couch surfing with a relative uh, without jeopardizing that family member's lease. Or if the older adult is the lease holder, um, that housing rule may make it difficult for the older resident to get that family member to help them with their personal care and assistance. Um, so one interviewee uh, described a client who lived in a subsidized housing but needed 24-hour care, had family who was willing to provide that care, but problems had arisen um, because the property management just didn't understand what it takes to have family members caring for someone 24 hours a day. Um, and that person had gotten lease violations for having multiple people in the apartment, um, not just not understanding what it looks like, what total care um, may look like um, in, in this context. Options are even further limited for people who don't have a home. Um, people who need daily support, such as with dressing or with bathing, but they don't need nursing home level care. Um, you know, we, we have a, a relatively robust uh, service system here in Massachusetts. We're very lucky, um, but you need to have a place in which services are delivered. Um, one interviewee explained that to spend the night in the shelter, um, you have to be able to take a shower by yourself. You have to be able to go to the bathroom by yourself, feed yourself, get in and out of bed. Um, she said, we don't have home, home health aids here. Um, but you can imagine that someone who needs help showering doesn't qualify necessarily for a nursing home. They, they may not, their needs may not be that extreme. Further complicating the situation, many programs and services are not available until needs are emergent or, or a crisis has occurred. Um, you know, a, a, a major support in that person's life has died, for example. Um, this limits options for proactive and preventative in, intervention. So our third takeaway, our final takeaway is that older adults often have a hard time accessing the benefits um, that should be available to them. So complex housing, health, and benefit applications can be difficult for someone to navigate at any age. Um, for instance, we, we heard interviewees talking about um, how housing and subsidy programs lack transparency about housing availability or clarity about eligibility, um, which leads people to make a separate application for every subsidy program and to further improve their odds, uh, they apply to programs in multiple housing authorities and each application can be dozens of pages long. So it's a very potentially onerous process um, just you know, to, to apply to hopefully meet a housing need. Um, but this can be particularly burdensome for older adults who might have limitations um, such as mobility and transportation. Uh, older adults with very low income are also less likely uh, to have access to technology or be technologically literate. Um, they may not have the documentation they need for these applications, their birth certificate, social security card. The document itself may have degraded over time or expired um, with, with replacement uh, costing both time and money. Um, and there's age-related communication challenges that make these application processes difficult. Um, these arise from cognitive changes, hearing and sight, you know, sensory changes um, that make it hard to type, perhaps, uh, trauma related to um, that, that create attention differences because housing instability, extreme poverty, and violence can be very traumatic experiences for people, and they can complicate someone's capacity uh, to complete applications and operate within a complex system. One interview explained it this way. Uh, she said, cognitive issues are a symptom of trauma. Um, it becomes hard to pay attention to applications and to understand them because people don't trust the government or services, maybe they had past issues where a program got shut down because of funding cuts and they're afraid to rely on another program. Um, another explained the stress of housing insecurity and that it can make housing applications impossible to prioritize, uh, saying you're trying to just figure out how you're gonna stay warm tonight. And you're not thinking, oh, let me go to the Boston Public Library to log in and check my account. So I'll close on opportunities. We heard many opportunities to better support older adults and help them 
use existing resources. Um, reducing wait times for services can minimize housing and health risk related to these application processing periods. One participant pointed to the efficient design of Massachusetts Medicaid program, which presumes eligibility and begins services immediately while the application is being processed. Interviewees also advocated for simplified application processes to reduce demands on older participants and increase accessibility of programs. For example, programs could share documentation and information through a repository or a universal application that simultaneously evaluates eligibility for multiple programs. Uh, one interviewee noticed that applications that are clear, concise, and use a friendly tone are easier for older applicants because they're less threatening, um, you know, and they're, they're just uh, easier for them to navigate. Low barrier services can also be a key component of benefit uptake and trust building. Um, as participants observed, older adults often contact a program for a very specific reason, like a meal service. Um, but as they develop familiarity with the program, they might branch out and start accepting other kinds of assistance. Their, their trust expands and, and they're willing to participate more, um, which, which leads us to, to the point that proactivity and prevention came up over and over again as a key component, uh, a key solution. Overall, continual connection to services and especially case management can establish trust and help an older resident address a problem as it arises, but before the issue threatens housing security. One interviewee considered clients who had been discharged and had become disconnected from services because some services are limited in time or scope and, and, and folks come into and out of services in that way. So she said when pri providers return to help those clients address a new need, they often discover a long list of problems that had cropped up in the interim and, and fallen through the cracks. She said, uh, this is when we find people who are not eating. Similarly, it's often more economically efficient for a person to maintain their current house than finding a new place to live. And relatively small dollar payment assistance mm -hmm. can help protect housing. So for instance, an organization might step in to pay rent while an older adult is in the hospital or in the rehab center. So that person has a home to be discharged into. Um, efficient access to home modifications and personal assistance um, also can increase housing stability. And then we have to acknowledge that there are older adults who are already unhoused or who don't live in a home uh, that can be saved and they're going to need a place to go. These residents need a wide range of affordable options that fit their abilities, their resources, and their preferences. It might include smaller spaces, single room occupancy arrangements, and housing with services and supports included. Um, affordable housing options need to be connected into community infrastructure like transportation. And finally, the rules that exclude certain groups from affordable housing need to be very carefully considered. Most foundationally, there needs to be more housing um, and people need to be able to afford the housing that's available to them. And benefit programs need to be aligned with actual local cost of living to ensure that recipients can have a basic quality of life uh, and, and housing of, of their choice. Thank you. Round of applause for Dr. Sheckler. Samara, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. And you had a great mix of quantitative outcomes, but also very moving qualitative results and individual stories that everybody can relate to. So thank you so much. That's a really important study. So now we're gonna to turn to two experts who are gonna put these results into context and add some commentary. So first, uh, Ms. Emily Cooper, who has a very special role in state government being part of two um, offices, um, Medicaid, that is Mass Health, and also the Office of Elder Affairs. So Emily, do you wanna start with some overall comments and then especially how, how does Medicaid fit into all of this? Everyone's looking for future innovation and support from, from Medicaid to, to, to support um, and address issues like you've just heard. Sure, thank you for, first of all, thanks for that great research. Thank you for the invitation here today um, and for highlighting this issue. Um, uh, sadly, it's it's not new. Many of the findings, um, you know, is something we're aware of and, and what I work on every day um, at the state. Um, it is something that we are, um, I, 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 wanna, I wanna focus on the, the, I think it was a third of the people are newly homeless. Um, and the point that keeping people housed is actually 
um, something we need to spend time on, prevention, um, just as much as the folks who are in uh, currently unsheltered. Um, and at, at the state Medicaid agency in Massachusetts, which is known as Mass Health, um, and at the Department of Elder Affairs, we are looking at how to keep people in their homes. There's about 110,000 housing apartments across the state that are subsidized, subsidized and they're for older adults. And we wanna make sure that there is a trusted resident service coordinator in every one of those um, apartments. Um, previous research that Samara did and, and the Joint Center showed that those people were integral in keeping people safe during COVID. It's sort of a cross between a doorman and a concierge and your trusted friend and a neighbor who knows what's going on with people in the building. Um, and they bring wellness programming and, and you know computer classes and other things to the building. And research has really shown that that keeps people healthy. Um, it co combats isolation, which is just as hard on your body as smoking, we've heard recently. So we're focused on bringing more of those, what we're calling place-based supports into senior affordable housing across the state. Um, I was really saddened by that story you told about uh, the woman who was in housing who needed 24-hour support and her family was coming in, but that the housing provider didn't understand that. Um, unfortunately, we hear about a lot of people getting evicted for things related to behavior or disability or needs like this. And so um, the state Medicaid agency actually just passed a couple of months ago started a new service, which is eviction prevention. We have providers embedded in housing courts. And when you are there and the judge is uh, looking at you and you're about to be evicted, you have some options. You can work with this service provider and try to deal with whatever led to the eviction. It's sort of a crisis intervention. And we have a really high success rate of keeping people from becoming homeless. So I wanna just it's, it, it focus on that prevention um, as well. Um, lastly, uh, and not, not any less important, uh, we have robust services for people who are chronically homeless, who are on the um, living unsheltered on the streets or in other places, regardless of their age. Uh, we have a very longstanding program that we have now just expanded to pretty much anybody on Medicaid, um, where we will help you look for housing. We will help you move into that housing. We will help you um, stabilize in that housing. It is a trusted peer. It is somebody who knows how to do those applications, somebody who knows how to get all that documentation, and then also help people adjust to living um, in an apartment if they've been living on the streets for a long time. Um, I'm, you're gonna hear from Latanya, who's actually one of those kinds of providers. Um, so we work closely with homeless providers and they bill Medicaid for those services. Um, so that is something that we have had in place for a while, and we continue to try and expand and enhance. Thank you so much, Emily. So that's a perfect segue to Dr. Wright and Latanya. Welcome again. And tell us uh, your general thoughts for Samara's presentation, but also more about your very important organization of HEARTH. Uh, we, we need to hear more about it and your very important mission. Thank you very much, and thank you all for this opportunity to be here. And thank you, Samara, for your presentation as well. Um, Looking um, just in terms of all of the information that was provided and the demographics, the data is very current in terms of what's here and what's now. Um, and a lot of services that we do just in terms of reaching the older adults, it's not as easy as one would think. Um, there are a lot of pieces to the puzzle that needs to come together. And so, you know, really appreciate that information that's been presented. Um, for HEARTH, um, as a nonprofit organization, HEARTH is dedicated to the elimination of homelessness among the elderly. Um, with that being said, when it was first developed, it was because of the fact that looking at working with older adults and providing health services, you know, trying to figure out how the individual will get these services if they don't have a stable place to live. Um, going and try to figure out from point A to point B, timing of meds and different care um, was an important factor in all of that. Um, so the organization currently through um, programs, um, prevention, shelter placement and housing programs, and looking at that prevention, especially as Emily stated, um, goes a long way in terms of it's more better to have an individual to be housed and prevent all of the negative effects and have safe housing 
versus a person being evicted, um, which create a huge, um, not only on the individual, but a huge problem economically, financial. Um, so HEARTH has a prevention program where we assist individuals and we help them find the resources um, for rental arrears, utilities. Uh, sometimes it, we have to do landlord mitigation um, based on what's going on. And then we have case managers that work with individuals that are on the streets and that are in shelters to help them to find permanent housing. And then we have the housing program where we have the 228 units, which is not enough. We still need more units, right? But those units come with services, care, um, on-site, which is very helpful uh, for the individual to continue their lifelong process. But um, the case managers that are out there go to the different local shelters and being able to rely on the Medicaid and terms of the programs like um, chronically homeless pro, um, community support programs for homeless individuals, those type of programs. They really help to put the services in place uh, for the individual. So they, the loneliness piece and not being able to make it to an appointment, those important things that a lot of individuals take for granted is very important to the elderly. Thank you so much, Latanya. Maybe I'll ask a question for both of you. I, I know we want a better future where we have better policies out there to address these issues that are so complex. Do either or both of you want to comment on better policies that we can all strive for in the future? And I don't know who wants to start on that. <laughs> Uh, so hard, you know, being a huge part with the national leadership to end elder homelessness. But um, when we look at the assisted living for elder health is extremely important. Um, we need, you know, the, the outcomes. There's a need for increased funding in assisted living, the ability to update homes, as Emily spoke about, um, so the individual can remain in their environment and grow old and to their end. Um, those things are important. The ongoing access to supportive services, um, part of, you know, that involves the accessibility um, for individuals to be able to go to those appointments that they need to go to. Um, there's a strong need uh, to have structures in place to address not only the current elderly population, but going forward, we need to prepare for the future generation because they will end to this place as well in terms of aging. So will we have the opportunity, we need to try the process now to get better services in place. Emily, you want to add to that or anything else that we can do to support your very important work? Um, sure. I, I think I think I would say a couple of things. Um, one is um, I've seen we have sort of a, a network and most states do of homeless providers and we have a network of sort of elder service agencies, also known as the area agencies on aging or or um, and depending on on how homelessness or housing insecurity you know, surfaces for a person, they kind of enter into one of those two separate pathways. Um, and those pathways, uh, particularly as a result of COVID, are very overwhelmed. You have a lot of providers, very mission-driven, doing a lot of work, but also very overwhelmed. And they don't always have the knowledge or capacity of the other one. So for example, um, homeless providers more and more are saying, I don't know how to get somebody durable medical equipment or a personal care. To, like those are things that I've never had to think about before. And the elder service providers are saying, I don't know how to fill out housing applications. <laughs> um, and so I really feel like the more we can encourage sort of cross training and collaboration more, you don't have to become an expert in the other area, but but working together, um, I think um, that's that's kind of what's going to be the future to some extent, unfortunately. Um, uh, that that given that there is sort of this this um, increase in this population, we need everybody to sort of learn from each other's strengths. Um, ultimately, though, at least in Massachusetts, I can't speak for all states. This is an issue about housing, um, and and um, you know the stories of people being in housing for 20, 30 years and their rents going up. Um, uh, you know that that is happening daily, um, and so. 
I always sort of say it's a housing supply issue and we don't have enough in Massachusetts of really any kind. Um, and so the more we can build, the better off we are in, in preventing some of these people becoming homeless and helping people who are homeless move into housing. And that all happens at a local level. Um, it all happens in your planning boards, at your select boards, with your zoning. So I'm always encouraging people when they ask me what they can do, it's go to those meetings, educate yourself, you know, vote or give input because those zoning rules are, are determining whether or not housing is built in your community and, and whether or not, and, and we just don't have, have enough. So um, really there's a lot, it doesn't, it feels like a huge problem, but it's, it can actually be distilled to no one shows up at planning board meetings because they're really boring <laughs> um, and they're really complicated. But if you show up and you say, wait a second, you know, why is this building sitting here empty for the past five years? Mm -hmm. Can we talk about this? Mm -hmm. um, then they'll say, oh, I need to respond. Somebody asked a question. So um, that's where you can be kind of the most helpful. What I'm really enjoying about our three speakers are that you're all so informed and have the big picture, but you get very practical yeah. for uh, individual action. So that that is really great. So thank you so much to both of you, Emily and Natanya. And now let's open it up to the uh, in-studio audience first. If there are folks here who have a question or two, we, we got a mic we can pass around. Uh, anybody here in the studio want to ask a question to the panel? Okay, uh, tell, tell us, uh, stand up and tell us who you are. Uh, my name is, can you hear me? Yeah, my name is Adam Goldstein uh, and I work for the city of Boston Mayor's Office of Housing. Thank you for uh, uh, adding me in, even though I don't, I don't have a Harvard ID. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my question to the to the panel, and thank you all so much, and thank you for your research. Um, the the piece about defining sort of elderly um, as more over fifty as opposed to over sixty two or over fifty five. Do you think there's any um, any any chance or conversations about the sort of very arcane rules around like the elderly definition and discriminating based on age on that age of sixty two or fifty five being moved? back at all, or maybe just for permanent supportive housing or anything like that. Thanks. I don't know if he's, I, 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 are you asking any asking, of us? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. We've done some great work with the city of Boston. We had um, these surge events for older adult homelessness where we defined people 50 and older and we brought the, the Boston Housing Authority about housing resources and we brought the service resources and Everybody came and in one day we you could walk out with an apartment and services. So it was awesome. Um, uh, I think there is a wiggle room uh, in, in housing, depending on what type of housing it is, if it's funded by the federal government or the state government. And we have lots and lots of different kinds about how you define sort of older adult. And so in that case, for example, the Boston Housing Authority was able to say, oh, these folks, they're chronically homeless, which means they have a disability. Uh, so we're going to be able to let them into all sorts of different housing because they're either an older adult or a person with a disability, both of which are often prioritized for their housing. So um, I don't know, um, you know, maybe from from your mouth to the federal government's ears, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, some of this is dictated uh, kind of outside of state or local purview. Thank you. Other questions from the audience here in the studio? OK, one more. Please, please stand up and identify yourself. Hi, I'm Maggie Martin. I'm a Master's of Architecture student at the GSD. Um, and my I have kind of two questions. Um, the first being, uh, when you're looking at the housing that's being provided for these older adults, um, what kind of services or parts of the design of the housing do you see that's missing that maybe needs to be included in, in future housing? Um, and then the second being in the sort of attempt to get these uh, new housing built, who are the sort of major players, the people that are actually making it happen or um, that you think need to be working harder to make it happen? Go ahead. Sure. Um, when you look at services and you talk about services for old, older adults in housing, um, the type of services that are needed, definitely need to look at what exactly, because everyone is different. Each individual will have different needs. So the supported piece in terms of thinking about having a permanent place to live 
you know, that definitely adds on to the length of time as far as your health. But also services like, how am I going to go to my medical appointment? How am I going to um, grocery shopping? Um, so the small things that we take for granted, those are huge, important services that need to be in place for everyday life skills for a lot of older adults. So that combination in terms of working with other agencies um, to bring all of that together is, is a key piece of it. And as new houses, um, new units are developed, the criteria and looking at in terms of what can we offer and what services can we have in place instead of just leaving the individual there once they're housed and go. It's all about making sure that they know about the connections in the community. Mm -hmm. um, it makes a huge difference to see someone on a regular basis, to know that you're not there, you're not lonely. You know, you may not have any family members to come just to say hi, but to know that a case manager or someone is coming there just to make sure that you're actually following through with your medication regimen or those little key important things means a whole lot. Thank you. Let's move to online questions. Uh, David Luberoff, you want to comment on a question or two that you're we've, reading online? We've had, we've had a series of really terrific um, questions. Um, Several of them, I think, build on your question about how do we get these different sectors to work together, uh, particularly, do we have any examples or at least thoughts on how funder, we, the funding systems might be changed, for example, to allow Medicaid to provide for more housing-related services? Wondering what your thoughts are on that, if you're seeing any interesting action on that. <clears throat> That's all we're talking about. <laughs> Seriously, that's that's kind of what what my job is, uh, why I have, a, a, I guess, a job. Um, <laughs> you know, Medicaid, Medicaid and Elder Affairs, neither of them pay for bricks and mortar, right? We don't, we don't, we can't build housing, we can't rent housing, we can't use our dollars in that way. But we recognize that eighty percent of a of a person's health is based on things that have nothing to do with their clinical makeup. Um, so where they live how they live, what they eat is, is very important. Um, so um, we have been working um, uh, with the federal government at the Medicaid agency at MassHealth to implement health-related social needs services, which range from housing search to housing stabilization, to home modifications, to things we're calling healthy homes, like getting somebody an air conditioner if they have asthma. Um, and so we are in negotiations with the federal government and, and imp so that we can implement those or expand them as they've been going on. So we definitely see Medicaid having a role. We also do a lot in the nutrition area. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I kind of say, if you build it, we will come because I can't, I can't build it. Uh, so there is sort of this part of, you know, we need people, we need the housing to exist as, or even, even the people who have rental vouchers, we need the landlords to take the vouchers um, in order for us to, as we heard from Samar, it's very hard to give somebody a personal care attendant when they are in a shelter, right? And to get them help with their activities of daily living when they're in a, in a congregate setting with you know bunk beds and group showers or whatever it may be. Keep going with that work, Emily. That's really important. <laughs> We're all counting on you. <laughs> David, other, another question maybe? From... There are a couple of, of questions. I, I know this is a, a study of, about Boston, but there, several folks have been asking about uh, how these issues play out in rural areas. Do we, do we know anything? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure either from the data or the service provider in terms of both magnitude and any particular challenges uh, about letting people be aware of these issues and also to respond to them. I'm happy to say a couple words. Um, like like you pointed out, we we really were focused on the Boston area, um, but the things that people talked about did reveal um, some some insight um, about about at least some of the challenges that are occurring um, outside of this denser uh, metropolitan area. So uh, connectivity as huge, right? And we had, you've heard that um, uh, from the panel over and over again, that people need to have transportation, they need to have access to social resources, um, they need to not be stuck and isolated in their home. Um, and those needs are more difficult to meet um, 
in lower density spaces. Um, they're just much less likely to have access to those resources. Um, and in fact, one of the folks that we interviewed, this isn't specifically about rural uh, places, but one of the uh, interviewees was talking about uh, an immigrant cultural community that they served um, and to relieve overcrowding situations of, of families that were kind of living in multi-generational small to you know small spaces together families would often move farther out of the city um, but this service provider was seeing as the oldest member of the family uh, got on in years they tended to try to come back into the city um, so that they could be part of their cultural community and have access to the services and resources um, once they weren't as mobile and weren't as connected socially in through um, all the ways that we stay connected as, as we're younger. Fascinating. I can't believe it, but we're getting close to the end here. So we're gonna have our dear friend, Dr. Jen Malinsky give some final comments. And Jen, thanks for all your great work in this area. Well, thank you. I just want to say thank you to to you and to the panelists um, and to my colleagues, Mara, and our, our amazing research assistants. Um, and especially, uh, we really appreciate the service providers who gave so generously of their time to participate in this research. Their, their passion was inspiring. Their reflections and insights are at the heart of this work. And this project for us was about learning from practice, learning um, what what the experience is of the providers who are out there every day and bringing that back to all levels of policy and to build a base for future research. Um, for us, it was this opportunity. We, Samar and I are part of a team that look at aging and housing. And this was an opportunity to look very closely at the causes and repercussions of housing insecurity. We know that a third of older adults are, are paying over a 30% of their income for housing. We know all the statistics, but this was really, so what does that mean? Um, so really important for us. And just appreciate everyone underscoring the need um, to align health and housing policy and programs and research. It's an acute challenge, um, but one that's really important. And it's been really great for me to work with Dr. Ko on the Initiative for Health and Homelessness so that we can try to do that at Harvard and, and build a bridge, um, build a base for um, more alignment in the future. So thank you to everyone. Thank you so much, Jen. Keep, keep it going. This is so great. A round of applause for inspecting it. And a round of applause for our three wonderful presenters. <laughs> Boy, we really packed this session with a lot of great information. So uh, I'm just delighted how this turned out with so many groups ac across Harvard sponsoring this series. So again, I want to thank the presenters and the attendees and the people watching online. The next event for the series uh, will be November 3rd from 12.15 to 1.15 at the Harvard Kennedy School and online. It's going to be entitled Homelessness is a Housing Problem and featuring Professor Greg Colburn from the University of Washington. Uh, we're very grateful to our colleagues again from the Harvard Joint Center on Housing Studies who have uh, sponsored this and will be hosting it. Uh, Chris Herbert, the director of the Joint Center who's in the audience today will be moderating that event. And the special guest will be Lyndia Downey of the Pine Street Inn here in Boston, who is very well known to so many of us. So we look forward to seeing you again. And thank you very much for your commitment to addressing these issues. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>